what we have here is primarily a spiritual warfare, but that's being fought by humans. Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. And welcome back feels particularly appropriate this time because this was the first interview I've done in like a month. I took the month of December off to rest and recuperate, finish up some grad school applications, enjoy some time with family, do some wedding planning, all of those things. And it was fantastic. So thank you all so much for waiting in that time for new content and for new interviews. And I'm so excited to bring you guys this one today. It is with a returner to the channel, Father Stephen DeYoung. I think you're really going to enjoy it. We talk about everything from giants, demons, spiritual warfare, divine violence, and how to read the church fathers. Yeah, it's a wide ranging conversation on his latest book, God is a Man of War. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. But before we jump into it, I want to say a real quick thank you to my patrons, subscribers, and merch buyers. And if you want to be a merch buyer, get new merch like this, which has come out recently. Go to gospelsimplicity.com and then click on the merch button. But also specifically to my patrons, the people that make this channel possible. Thank you all so much. It is such a, a privilege to get to do what I do and it wouldn't be possible without all of you. So thank you for that. If you'd like to support this channel, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel simplicity and you can get all types of cool perks. You can get free merch and lots of fun stuff. Also, I want to say if you want to make a one-time donation, you can do so at paypal.me slash gospel simplicity. Thank you all so, so much for your support. With all that being said, here is the interview. Well, today I am joined by Father Stephen DeYoung. The very reverend Dr. Stephen DeYoung is pastor of Archangel Gabriel Orthodox Church in Lafayette, Louisiana. He is also the host of the Whole Council of God podcast from Ancient Faith and the author of the Whole Council blog, as well as co-host of the Lord of Spirits podcast. Father Stephen holds a PhD in biblical studies from Amridge University. He was previously on the channel, not too long ago actually, to discuss his former book, The Religion of the Apostles. Great book, and I had a lot of fun with that interview, so you guys should check out those things. And today we will be discussing his latest book, God is a Man of War. Father Stephen, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Awesome. Well, I haven't had too many people on the channel twice, but I'm delighted to have you on the channel again <laughs> today. And at this point, if you keep putting out books this fast, it's going to be hard to keep booking <laughs> these interviews. But uh, thank you uh, for your most recent book. I really enjoyed it. And it's I remember when we talked, uh, you mentioned that it was coming out when we did our last interview, or it was your next project. And if I recall, the, your publisher, the people at Ancient Faith, were wondering if this was going to be a very popular topic. It's maybe not something they had published on a lot. And you said, I, I think this is something people are talking about. And I know in Protestant circles, there's certainly been a lot of books written on this topic, especially kind of from like an apologetics perspective. So what inspired you to write this book and what need do you see it filling? Yeah, well, I had... Uh... The immediate cause was that I had in one week uh, two different people, unrelated people, uh, email me and ask me to recommend a book on violence in the Old Testament from an Orthodox perspective. And I couldn't think of one, at least in English. So I said, well, <laughs> that's something that by virtue of my degree, et cetera, I'm qualified to write. So. That's, that's, I think I talked about last time how sort of how I'm going to take the time, especially with a book, to, to put a book together. I don't want to just do my version of something that already exists because there's so, there are so many holes out there that need filling. So this sort of identified itself as one of those. Um, I'm hoping that, uh, as you mentioned, and I, I'm aware of, uh, this has been, and continues to be a very lively discussion in, in the Protestant world. Uh, that said, I also have gotten a lot of questions from Orthodox people uh, about how to deal with it's usually in the form of some particular passage, some particular thing in the Old Testament that they've sort of become aware of and that is troubling them. Uh, so hopefully it will address that too. But also, I think the perspective of orthodox theology on these issues is different than the variety of perspectives that you get 
in the West for various reasons. Uh, there, there's sort of an internal discussion that's been going on in the West. Uh, and I think that there's sort of another perspective that hopefully this book can bring to people uh, yeah. who are only sort of familiar with those Western perspectives. Yeah, I think... You know, I, I think it's one reason that so many of the Orthodox interviews I do end up being pretty popular ones on my channel, because so often a question has been debated. And this is one that maybe this perspectives are similar between Protestants and Catholics. But in the West, there's kind of been two perspectives on things. And then it's always really interesting to bring in the Orthodox perspective. I remember when I first did this with the Reformation, like it was... There, in my view, the, in my experience, there were two views on it. And then I remember reading, I think, Rock and Sand and going, oh, wow, like there's this whole third party that has a completely different look on this. And so I'm excited uh, for you to be able to do that with this topic in particular. And I'd be curious if you have, I mean, on the one hand, it could just be that the English speaking Orthodox world isn't that big. And it's, you know, only in recent years that I think we've seen a ton of publishing in this area or relative to prior. But do you think there's any reason why this whole had kind of persisted for a while, why there hadn't necessarily been a lot of English speaking Orthodox books on this subject? Um, because you said the questions do seem to be there. A any thoughts on that or? Yeah, I mean, I think part of part of it is, as you said, that that English speaking Orthodoxy is still sort of coming into its own. Most Orthodox literature you find in English that's more than, that's from before the 80s, shall we say. <laughs> it's mostly translations of things written by other people. And even then in that early phase, you know, the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, where that kind of thing starts to show up, a lot of it is uh, people from other, you know, Orthodox folks, but whose heritage is somewhere else. Right now, now writing in English. Uh, so having uh, Orthodox Christians whose first language is English really addressing a lot of these theological topics is relatively, relatively recent. And uh, in, you know, the U.S. and Canada, Australia, uh, Britain, you know, the places where we speak English, uh, the Orthodox Church is a, is a relative minority among Christians even, you know, let alone from the population in general. Uh, and so uh, we're sort of just starting to come into our own on this. And uh, a lot of, I think in particular, um, well, I'll back up a step. Biblical studies is really a, a Protestant phenomenon as an academic. And, and you'd expect that from if folks believe in sola scriptura, right, then biblical theology becomes incredibly important right off the bat. Uh, so uh, if you even look on the Roman Catholic side, uh, Roman Catholic participation in biblical studies really starts in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and so orthodoxy is even a little later than that, but particularly with the Old Testament, um, the East does not have a long tradition of thoroughgoing Old Testament reading. And what I mean by that is uh, the Western lectionary has a long history of having Old Testament readings right throughout the year. Um, the uh, Orthodox lectionary tradition is a little more spotty on that. Um, so we have Old Testament readings, for example, before great feasts that are related to the feast. Uh, we have a, uh, an ancient tradition of during Lent reading through Genesis and Isaiah and Proverbs. Uh, and then in Holy Week, reading the first part of the book of Exodus and Job. Uh, so there are portions of the Old Testament that are read publicly and frequently in the Orthodox Church. But there are other portions of the Old Testament that as an average churchgoer, unless you're doing your own Bible reading, uh, you're not going to encounter in a regular church year uh, in the Orthodox Church. And because it's not in the lectionary, if what you're doing is you're following the daily readings uh, in a church calendar or something, there's not going to be an Old Testament reading a lot. So there will be these chunks that are left out. And so 
I think there was also it, it, people were less likely people who were just going to the Orthodox Church and weren't encountering other Christians and weren't engaging in broader Christian discussions didn't encounter a lot of these things in the Old Testament uh, because some of these readings, because they're, you know, because uh, <laughs> of their nature, aren't the ones you're going to read, you know, that, that on Christmas Eve, you know, before, <laughs> before you celebrate Christmas. Um, so, yeah, so th th there's that, I think, is one reason why those questions have started to arise more and more and more and more recently uh, within the English speaking Orthodox world. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I feel like people often come to these questions. I mean, I'm sure from a variety of perspectives, but I see two very prominent ones. One is through challenges posed by atheists. Specifically, I think the new atheists latched onto a lot of these, you know, the guys like Hawkins and, um, or Hitchens, I meant to say, and, um, and the lot of them. Um, you, you'll hear these passages and it's like, oh, wow, I, I never came across those. Or uh, maybe a bit more innocent way that people come across them um, is people set out, especially around this time of year sometimes, to, to read through the whole Bible in a year. And they make it through Genesis. And they're like, that, that's pretty good. They get to Exodus. Leviticus is usually the graveyard of those reading plans. But if they keep going, they come across these passages and think like, where did these come from? I, I'd never read any of these because, I mean, Quite honestly, yeah, they don't show up in sermons, whether it's from a lectionary based thing or, you know, if you're a Protestant pastor and you're thinking through what you want to teach on this year, these often don't rise to the top. And I think that's understandable, but I do think we need to do something with these passages. And we'll get to at least one of them later. But I love in your book, you do have a section on problem passages because we can't forever just keep them, you know, tucked away and, and pretend like they don't exist there. We, we need to be figuring out what, what are these in the Bible for? And maybe that even challenges our perspective on like what each of these texts is supposed to do for us. All, are these all kind of, you know, uh, like moral fables, like we often approach scripture, but those are all big questions. I want to jump into the book a little bit here um, as we kind of pivot from, you know, the 30,000 foot view, but at the very outset, your book kind of struck me as unique, not only for being an orthodox perspective on this, but for the title itself. Now, I don't know if you picked the title or if the publisher did. I know often the publisher does, but it's certainly a, it seemed like a, a very distinct direction by titling it, God is a Man of War. Because in my experience, a lot of the recent books on divine violence in the Old Testament have as kind of their express purpose in a way to kind of tone down that whole man of war violence con uh, all of those themes and overtones and you, you display it on the front you got a red cover big god is a man of war what, what talk me through that a little bit like what what was the thought behind that because it, it, it seems to be intentionally kind of going against the the current a bit it's no secret that today perhaps more than ever people are struggling with their mental Health. I think if I asked you all to virtually raise your hand and said, hey, are you currently struggling? Have you ever, do you consistently struggle with mental health, be it anxiety, depression, or whatever? I think many of us, myself included, would raise our hand and say, yeah, like things get hard sometimes and sometimes it feels like more than we can handle. But the problem is despite facing these difficult circumstances and dealing with these mental health crises at times, so few of us end up actually getting the help that we need. It might be because it can take so long to get into a counselor or therapist or you think it's gonna to be too much or maybe there's this thought in the back of your head that Christians aren't allowed to have mental health problems. And does that mean there's something wrong with me? Well, from the beginning of my channel, far before it had any type of reach or influence, I have wanted to help do my part to help end that stigma. That's why one of my first videos I ever made was titled, You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too, hoping that that would give people the permission to go out and get the help they need without being worried about these shameful stigmas that people have attached to it. Well, now I am so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling, who is who are leading the charge in helping people get the help they need. Rather than having to wait months to get into a counselor, if you sign up for Faithful Counseling, you can be paired with a counselor in 24 hours or less. I don't know if you've ever attempted to do something like this through traditional avenues, but if you have, you know just how crazy it is to be able to pair 
up with someone that quickly. All of their counselors are licensed and have over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with them in flexible ways. You can do uh, video sessions, phone calls, uh, private messaging. It is really fantastic. They even have a live chat. It is such an amazing service. I'm so excited to be partnering with them, and I'd really encourage you to check them out. by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do so, you'll get 10% off your first month, and I think it will be really, really helpful for you. Now, I do want to say that this isn't a crisis line, and if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, I would encourage you so, so much to not go through this alone, but to reach out to a crisis line. I'll put one on the screen here. But if you are looking for mental health help, I think Faithful Counseling could be great for you. They will connect you with a Christian counselor, and I know people come to my channel from a variety of backgrounds. So if you want one specifically from your Christian denomination, they will work with you to try to make that happen so that you can get Christian mental health help. I think it's going to be fantastic for you. I can't wait for you to check it out. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. You get 10% off your first month. After that, it'll be $260 per month, but there is financial aid available for those who qualify. Once again, guys, don't hesitate to get the help you need. Faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. Yeah, I, I did pick the, the title and uh, there was a little resistance to it, but not a lot in terms of, of using that as the title of the book. Um, and I mean, the title itself, of course, is uh, from Exodus uh, 15. And so I said, well, this is this is a book about explaining violent, disturbing passages from the Old Testament. So I'll take this violent sounding verse from the Old Testament, and make it the title. So the book sort of does what it says on the tin, you know, um, but uh, I was also happy with, I did not design the cover, but I was very happy with it because I think it kind of looks like an 80s Christian metal album uh, <laughs> a little bit. Um, but the uh, uh, the idea was that I, I didn't want to, as you said, I mean, you were very kind about it. I didn't want to sort of try and soft pedal, right, what's there. Um, and that's for that's for several reasons. Um the the i mean we we view the the violence in in scripture as a problem but the violence that's in the scriptures and the way in which god responds to it and god is found even within it uh that's our key to understanding violence that exists in the world and even if we were to soft pedal and say, hey, none of this stuff ever happened and whatever we want to say about the Old Testament, violence is still in the world. People still experience violence and are victimized by violence. These things happen. And they've happened since the ancient world. Um, they, you know, I don't want to sound like Steven Pinker. They probably happen less now than they did in the ancient world, but uh, they still happen. Right. And um that has to be, if we then sort of marginalize the violence that is in the Old Testament, then we don't have any key to understanding the violence in the real world. Uh, if we just say, oh, no, God has nothing to do with it, then, you know, people aren't going to be able to understand their, their experiences in the real world. So I think that's a key part of why it's there and and why we can't soft it. It will come and confront us sort of anyway. And... Um, I understand why it's hard to look at too. When you write a book like this, you have to kind of strike a balance, I think. And it's sometimes a difficult balance. There's there's a semi-famous quote from Stanley Kubrick. Uh, someone asked him when Schindler's List came out. Uh, Stanley Kubrick was known as a director for sort of putting things on screen that were shocking or disturbing, you know, despite the fact that it might hindered the blockbuster status of some of his movies. Um, and so someone asked him what he thought about so many people going to see a movie about the Holocaust, right? If he, if he ever thought that would happen. And Stanley Kubrick said, Schindler's List isn't about the Holocaust. He said, the Holocaust is about 6 million people who were murdered. Schindler's List is about 200 people who survived. People will go see 
<laughs> the story of 200 people who survived horrible violence. They don't want to deal with the reality of what happened there. Uh, and it's not just a question of scale. In fact, sometimes those numbers protect us. I mean, if, if uh, the story of a single human child in one of these Old Testament stories was told in detail, where he knew who this was, that would be more than anyone could take to read, you know, unless they were a sociopath or something, you know. Um, so you have to strike a balance between conveying the reality of what's there and the reality of what exists in the world but without it becoming something that no one can bear to look at or something that's sort of, sort of pornographic, you know, in the depiction, lurid, you know, in the, the depiction of, of violence. You don't want that either. Um, and that could be difficult to strike. And so I don't blame anyone for sort of soft peddling it, right? If you're going to err on one side or the other, you're probably better off erring on that side <laughs> right, than, than the other. But I, I wanted to be as honest as possible and direct as possible and saying, no, you know, what's there and how do we deal with this? How do we understand this? Yeah, I really appreciate you making that link between the violence in the Old Testament that we come across and the violence in the world. And I, I'm not, you know, cultured enough to say this with any authority, but I, I do wonder in part that perhaps those of us in the West struggle so much with these problem passages because we've lived for the most part, a lot of us, or I can speak for myself at least, free from really egregious violence happening close to my home. You know, for people that grow up in completely different worlds or in times of war or different things, I imagine you might read these passages differently. There's a very famous quote from Miroslav Volf around that kind of idea around uh, God's justice and how could you make sense of that until he went through just some horrific things. And I also appreciate you talking about kind of striking that balance of being honest with the text, but also, so being honest on the one hand, but not going so far that it becomes these lurid depictions. Um, I, I think you do so wonderfully in the book, and I really do appreciate that about it. You start the book, and this is kind of in that vein, but by talking about some of the bad answers that we give to the problem of divine violence, I imagine you know one of those is just kind of ignoring it or completely soft peddling it. But what are some of those other bad answers you think we typically give to this real kind of uh, struggle for people as they read these passages? Yeah, yeah. And, and they're bad answers because they don't really deal with and answer the questions people really have, right? So, um, and sometimes these are given, you're in kind of a debate or quasi-debate setting with someone who is pointing to these Old Testament passages, maybe even in bad faith, like from a, from a new atheist perspective or something, where they're they're casting it in the most negative possible terms, you know, and just try using it as an attack. And so, the answer isn't really trying to delve into the text or answer the questions of people legitimately disturbed. It's just sort of trying to parry the attack, you know, sort of knock it aside so that we can continue in the, the debate or discussion. Uh, so uh, one, of, one of them uh, that is unfortunately very common now is just to say, well, none of that stuff actually happened. <laughs> right. So, and sometimes they'll even try and making it quasi-scientific by saying, well, there's no archaeological evidence that X, Y, Z happened. Right. Well, there's no archaeological evidence of most events in the ancient world right? by that standard. So unless you want to believe, say we believe, know nothing about the ancient world, we know nothing about the Bronze Age. You have to at some point, you know, believe some texts. Um, but uh, the idea that none of this ever happened or this is a parable, this is a moral story, this is a fable. It's trying to communicate this or that lesson, but it didn't really happen. So you don't have to worry about it. So God didn't really do that, or God didn't really tell the Israelites to do that, right? It was just sort of this object lesson. Uh, that actually, if you, while it sounds like at first, oh, okay, well, then I don't need to worry about it because it didn't happen. Uh, that, if you think it through, is actually worse, right? Uh, and here's why. If I came to you and said, so I follow this religion, 
and I worship this God and I have this book that will tell you all about the God I worship. Now, this book is fiction. This book is just a series of stories that will tell you what my God that I worship is like, right? And that we use as a guide to our lives. And then I handed you Game of Thrones, right? You would probably look at me and be like, uh, right? <laughs> So if we pause it, right, this is fiction. So God could have told any story he wanted to, 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 to reveal himself to us. And he chose to tell stories full of violence and rape and, and killing and genocide and murder, right? That makes God look very bad, shall we say, right? Whereas if these are things that happened and what we're receiving in the text is God's perspective on these things that happened, why they happened, how they happened, what we should learn from the fact that they happened, right? Then, then that potentially, we still have to work through the text, but that potentially uh, allows even something despicable, a story of sin and, and, and horror, can still reveal God to us in a certain way. Right, if we if we come to understand it and understand the perspective from which it's being told, um, and that's that's related closely to one of the big downfalls of a certain reading. A lot of uh, sort of conservative religious folk, regardless of Protestant, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, have sort of been taught: well, you need to read everything literally, right, and the way they understand literally the word literal of course gets used in a lot of ways now people use literally just mean really or very you know that's i literally couldn't get out of bed it's like well you could but yeah <laughs> so um but uh literally is taken to mean that the primary claim that's being made by the text is that this happened right so uh, it's not commenting on it, meaning it's just saying that it happened. And a corollary to that is then people think, well, if the Bible has this in it, if the Bible's describing this event, as opposed to other events that it could have described, that the Bible is automatically saying that this is good. Right. So when we read the book of Judges and we see all of this mayhem and murder and destruction, right? Somehow the Bible is saying that all the people it's describing are good and all the things they're doing are good. And God is somehow blessing all of this, right? Whereas it should be very clear, especially the historical books of the Old Testament, if we read them in context, that a lot of, if not most of the people described are not given God's approval. Uh, this is the constant refrain all through first and second, well, first and second Kings primarily. Uh, that, you know, here's all the horrible, wicked things this person did in about a paragraph. And then if you want to read about all the other things they did, go read their annals, go read the official, you know, they'll tell you about all the good stuff they did, but here's the bad stuff. Um, so yeah, we have to, we have to get past that pitfall sort of here also that the fact that it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's saying that it's good. Right. And that, I think, is what causes people, having that presupposition is what causes people to think that, well, saying it didn't happen solves the problem, right? Because if it did happen, that means God approved of it. So if it didn't happen, then we don't have to worry about it. But both of those sort of presuppositions are flawed, right? Yeah, I think that's a helpful kind of lens through which to approach these stories kind of as you know most people who have taken a hermeneutics class i'm sure you had this little rhyme or half rhyme kind of you know descriptive doesn't equal prescriptive what's being described in the text isn't necessarily being prescribed it's not being told for you to do that and so i think once you break that link you can say you can get away from that kind of well the only point of recording this is because it happened and if it we're recording it's because it's good so we're, we're allowed to approach the text with a maybe different uh, lens here. I'd be curious to press into that a little more. What kind of posture should we have going into these texts? So we're not only having this fight between did it happen, did it not, or you know, if it's in the text, it must be good. But I think a lot of people struggle when we talk about maybe these bad answers given to these texts of like, how do I even evaluate these things? And I think 
some people, especially from a very maybe conservative or fundamentalist background, have this approach of like, okay, uh, what do they say? Uh, God said it, that settles it, or whatever it is. The Bible said it, so that settles it. It's like, if it's there, it's good. Or if God did it, it's automatically good. Now, we do have these theological presuppositions going into it, that, that God is love and that we see him fully revealed in Jesus. And we'll see this kind of down the line. But but to what extent do you think maybe pastorally people should wrestle with these texts? Should they just kind of say, well, okay, you know, God did it, it's good. or Or should they really be kind of what's the heart posture does that question make sense if you're anything like me you might have this vague sense that you should be investing or maybe you actively want to invest but you just find the whole thing a little confusing i've been there i totally get that between wondering what should you buy and where should you invest who which companies do you pick and when do you pick them and on top of all of that how do you know that your money isn't going to be supporting companies that are against your moral values. To be honest, it's all very complex, but that is where Christ-Centered Capital comes in, C3. C3 is an organization that exists to help you not only be a good steward of your money and be able to invest wisely by giving you timely stock picks, mock portfolios, even alternative investing opportunities like crypto and all of that and so much more, but they do it in a way that gives you ratings of these companies based on what they are supporting and whether or not they would line up with Christian moral convictions. It's amazing, so helpful, and allows you to take that investing to a more conscious level and see, is this really something that I would want to be supporting? I highly recommend you check them out, and you can do so by going to ChristCenteredCapital.com. And if you do, be sure to use the promo code C3Austin for your first month absolutely free. You don't even have to pay anything. You can see if you like it, see what kind of services they offer you. After that, it would be $7 per month. And just so you know, 50% of those profits will be going back into Christian organizations like pro-life organizations, Christian colleges, and much, much more. They're a great organization that I'm so happy to be partnering with. And again, I'd encourage you to check them out at ChristCenteredCapital.com and use the promo code C3Austin to get your first month free. Yeah, yeah, I... I... I think um, the the first thing that has to happen is that whole question of did it happen? Did it happen exactly like this? We have to set that aside. You can't just forget that because modernism has happened, right? And and that whole question is a development of modernism, right? So, uh, I mean, if you'd said to an ancient person, right, well, did this happen exactly this way? They'd be like, what right so um that's sort of uh, so we can't become ancient people but we can kind of set that aside for the moment right so we say here's the event being described here's how it's being described right and then uh context is also very important right Wh where is this in the history of god's people what has just happened before what has happened after right um why, right, why is God doing this? Or uh, is God even directly in the picture, <laughs> right? That that helps a lot, right? If, if we're talking about uh, the story of Jetha, for example, in Judges, uh, which his sacrifice of his daughter is one of the things I deal with in the problem passages, God is pretty much silent in that whole story. God doesn't really say or do anything during that story. So uh, we can't bring with us the presupposition. We can't sort of read him into it, right? When when he's staying silent and this is just being, being narrated. Um, and so I think it requires us to go a, go a little deeper, right? Because I think while that answer is all well and good, I also think from an actual heart perspective, it's fake. Right. It's just saying, oh, it's fine. <laughs> right. And there's still sort of the nagging doubt because you haven't actually dealt with it. You haven't actually understood it. Right. And these are in the text of the scriptures not to cause us problems. Right. It's not sort of God throwing us some stumbling blocks. Right. They're there to communicate something to us. Right. There, there are passages where that's easier to see and passages where that's harder to see. 
but everything that's there is there for a reason, right? And uh, the scriptures weren't written to us, right? They were written to ancient people, but they are written for us. And so there is something there for us. And so just papering over it with, well, that sounds horrible, or I don't get it, or I'm disturbed by that, but it's fine, <laughs> is at minimum, you're depriving yourself of whatever it, it was that was there for you uh, that, that, that could have helped you. And as we go through life and we face situations ourselves, some of those lessons become important. Right. Some of those things that we have to learn, some of those things that God wants to communicate with us, some of the ways God wants to reveal himself to us become important. They may not seem important right now, but they may become very important for us or for someone we know, someone we love, someone we can help in the future. Yeah, that's a great point. And the Bible is a book for, for all seasons of life, though maybe not every passage speaks to you the same in each season there. And yeah, I, I really appreciate that approach you give and that call to, to go a little deeper and to not just say, ah, it's fine. Like, I, I feel this tension, but I'm just going to act like I don't. And I think, you know, we all recognize that in other areas of our life, no matter whether we tend to do it a lot, I, I think we know that that doesn't ultimately work, whether that's with the biblical text or in a relationship or whatnot, you have this sense of like, this, I, I don't like this, this, I, I don't actually agree with this, or I'm not sure. I'm going to just pretend like everything's okay. That only works for so long. And I think that's actually going to undermine people's faith, not allowing themselves to, to do the deep work and say, these passages are difficult. They're complex. Let me see what I can learn here, recognizing some of those things. And so hopefully we'll be able to maybe model a, just a bit of that or talk through some of that today. I want to jump into the book a little further. And in the first chapter, you give these three categories that I think are going to be helpful for people when we talk about justice. Because all of these questions of divine violence are ultimately, you know, interwoven with questions of, but is this just? There's violence, but then we have this sense of kind of gratuitous violence. And that really seems to be what we struggle with most when something is done that we just can't see any reason for. And so the, the three categories of justice that you give are retributive, distributive, and social. And you argue that all three of these are present in scripture. Now, for people who maybe aren't as familiar or they want to kind of use this as a tool or a hermeneutic, how can these categories and ideas of justice help us understand what God is doing in violent passages? Because I suspect that the primary concern people have is precisely that these things aren't just. So maybe these categories can help out a little bit. Right, right. Yeah, there, there are a minority of people who are true pacifists and just think violence as such is always wrong. Most people uh, would accept that there is some conceivable instance or instances where violence would be sort of a necessity, as, as awful as it is. And the concern then, as you said, is that, that that violence only be used and only be used proportionally to what is just and to what is necessary uh, for justice. And yeah, we as modern people have very skewed concepts of justice. Probably of all three of those forms of justice are, are pretty uh, skewed, and we tend to weight a couple over the others. So sort of the short definition of those three is retributive justice is, I mean, you could probably tell from the term retribution, <laughs> right? Revenge, the idea of uh, someone has been harmed uh, someone has been victimized, and so the perpetrator has some kind of harm inflicted on them. Uh, and then uh, distributive justice is the is probably the speaking in terms of the scriptures is the largest and most overarching concept of justice, uh, and this is sort of built into the Hebrew concept that underlies. Uh, the Hebrew word uh, mishpat, which is justice, uh, the related verb is shafat, and that's what we translate as to judge. Uh, and justice in that sense, it's and this is not just an Israelite thing. This is over the ancient Near East. So the Egyptians have a concept of ma'at that's very similar to this, other cultures as well. The idea of justice in this sense is that everything in the world is in its proper place. 
and is functioning properly. Everything's interrelated, but everything is the fabric of the cosmos is all knit together correctly. And so for ancient people, this included the gods, this included for Israel, of course, this included God. Um, and then uh, this also included, you know, the king, the nobles, every, you know, all the way down, everyone is in the right place and functioning. Uh, and so injustice then happens when those things get out of balance. Something isn't in the proper place. Something isn't functioning properly. Something's been broken. And then to judge means to restore that balance. Right? And that's why the judges in the book of Judges are called judges, even though they're not sitting and hearing cases and hitting a gavel. Right. <laughs> but what happens is things are out of balance. Some oppressor has come in to Israel because Israel has sinned. So Israel sins and throws things out of balance. God sends an oppressor. They repent. And then God raises up a judge to set things right, to put things back in order. Uh, so that's distributive justice. Uh, and then uh, social justice is a super loaded term today in the United States, especially. Uh, but what I'm getting at there in the book and in terms of how it functions in, in Scripture is the idea that justice doesn't just pertain to human agents. Uh, that it's not just a question of this person did this action and it is right or it is wrong. Uh, but that justice also has to do with the societal structures and cultural structures that we create as humans, right? So uh, regardless of what you think about various social justice movements, I think pretty much anyone you ask can think of a law that they think is unjust right? and should be changed, right? Um, or think of some societal or cultural situation that they think is unjust and should be changed. Uh, we would all disagree probably about what those are, but we all understand that category. And so there is a concern, especially in the Torah, because the Torah, of course, is establishing what the society of Israel is supposed to look like, that the society be established in a way that is just. Right. And uh, so then uh, some sort of quick examples right, of those kinds of justice uh, that show up in the Torah. Um, retributive justice, you could think about, for example, and we may discuss this more, but the death penalties, right, would be an example of that, where it's clear that this is sort of a a punishment, right? We're not we're not sort of redistributing anything, right? Um, the most common form in, in the Torah, because as we said, this is sort of the overarching concept of justice, is distributive, right? So if I steal something, I have to pay back five times what I stole, right? So by me stealing, I've put things out of whack. Now we're bringing them back into account. Um, but there are also more interesting and maybe more controversial today examples. For example, the Torah has a commandment that if my neighbor is hoarding food and I don't have enough food to feed my family and I take from him just enough food to feed my family, that's not stealing, according to the Torah. Um, that he was stealing by not helping me and my family when, when we needed it. Um, so, but that again is this distributive capacity, right? Something is out of whack because this person has more food than they need while other people are starving. And so we solve that by giving them the food they need, just the food they need, but the food they need. Uh, and then social justice, probably the clearest example would be the Jubilee year uh, in, in the Torah, which if it had been followed, which we know it wasn't, but if it had been followed, Every 50 years, all of the land would have reverted back to the families that originally had it. All the slaves would have been freed. And slavery was mainly about debt uh, in Israel. So those debts would be forgiven and cleared. And that would have prevented what we now call generational poverty, right? So I could be a bad businessman or lazy or what have you and squander my inheritance, <laughs> right, for my family, but my son and my grandson would get another shot. They'd start over again on a level playing, playing field 
And if they were more diligent than me and, and more honest than me and, and did better than me, they would not be penalized for what I had done. Uh, so that that is an attempt to put in place a social structure that would establish justice and, and prevent that sort of ongoing, ongoing issue. And so I, I think when I mentioned that we sometimes emphasize some uh, to the expense of others, I think in the West, in the modern West, uh, our focus has primarily shifted to retributive justice. And I mean this culturally in the sense that the way we think about crime and punishment, right? <laughs> like um, the way we think about, you know, and, and, and even when we're just talking about putting someone in prison, we say, well, this, this certain amount of suffering is proportional to <laughs> somehow the evil thing you did. And so once you have suffered this much, you spent this much time in prison, you've paid the penalty. Now you've paid your debt to society. Right. And so now, now, now things are balanced because you've endured this, uh, this hardship or this uh, suffering. And that plays out theologically too. penal substitutionary atonement, obviously being the biggest example, right? This idea of God's justice is this retributive thing that sin has to be punished. Um, and I think that is, that has gotten very much out of balance in the modern West. Um, and uh, while it's not absent, right? God says, vengeance is mine, not vengeance is nobody's, right? Um, but uh, that, that the balance needs to shift a little more uh, if we're talking about the way it is in the scriptures to uh, distributive justice with retribution and social being sort of components underneath that, that are part of that, that functioning. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And I think you're right. I think that retributive justice has, at least at like the foundational level of how Western societies think about what justice is, has really been probably the most definitive type. That, that's how we think, like you said, crime and punishment or different, you know, we're thinking of this idea of the, the, the punishment fits the crime and that there's some type of equality there and that's our go-to method. But it's also intriguing to me because I, I think in criticisms of scripture, and maybe this makes sense if this is what we're most familiar with, but it's often retributive passages that get criticized or that cause people maybe the most unease. And maybe that's because we have this ingrained sense of retributive justice and this is something we can identify as retributive, but seems odd. I appreciate you giving those other examples as well because I think they do challenge us. If I don't think anyone kind of, no matter where they land on the political spectrum or just ideological spectrum, gets away from the Old Testament without feeling challenged by the, the world they set up from the Jubilee year um, to what you mentioned with the, the food there. All of these things are super interesting. Now, you talk about a move towards distributive justice with those other two kind of informing it. Now, when you talked about that, you talked about how it's actually linked to their whole cosmology, which I know is something that you are, are big on. And in your Lord of Spirits podcast, you guys do a, a lot to kind of help draw out ancient cosmology. To, to what extent then is the Bible's sense of justice tied to its cosmology? I imagine this is where we find you know your chapter spiritual warfare which is absent from most i haven't surveyed them all but i imagine most books on divine violence don't have a chapter on spiritual warfare or a section on i'm going to probably butcher this pronunciation gigantama gigantamaki gigantamaki well, however you say that word not a frequent one for me um but but i'd, li I'd like to tie these things together right so distributive justice is related to israelite cosmology to understand their sense of justice, how important is it that we understand how they viewed the whole cosmos that had to be balanced? Right. I, well, I think it's uh, critically important. <laughs> that, um, I, and I think this is another place where a lot of times we, we go wrong um, because uh, we tend to read the Old Testament like materialists. Um, we've been, again, as... as we're modern people, whether we like it or not. Uh, and so there's this tendency where we sort of, we have these brackets. 
uh, where we'll bracket certain things and how wide those brackets are sort of depends on your, your religious sensibilities. Uh, so some folks like our liberal Protestant friends have very narrow brackets, right? You try to talk to them about angels and demons, even they're going to look at you sideways, right? Um, they've kind of got God in the brackets and that's about it. Um, and then, you know, that'll expand a little more to, uh, in, in other groups. So if you talk to say an average conservative Protestant, they'll have those brackets expanded to sort of what's in the Bible. Right. If you start trying to talk to them Amer about a miracle outside the Bible, they're going to go, eh. right? <laughs> and, you know, they might accept it, but even if you present it to them as, you know, my uncle was miraculously healed, and we all pray for healing for people, right? But if you say my uncle was miraculously healed, they'll kind of want to look and make sure there's no material explanation for it before they'll say, okay, I guess it was miraculous, right? Um, so, but if it's in the Bible, it's miraculous, right? That no problem there. It's inside the brackets. Uh, and then, if you're talking about most um, traditional, at least Roman Catholic and, and Orthodox Christians, because of we've got the miracles in the early church and martyrs and that kind of thing, brackets will come out a little more, but they're still there, and eventually you'll hit the edge where <laughs> where af and outside of those brackets. We're just as materialist as Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins. That's, um, I won't go into it. I don't know how consistent they actually were, but um, the uh, but but we look at things the same way. We look at things as if we were a scientific atheist, unless they're inside those religion brackets, religion category. Uh, and that even includes then when we when we go to read the Old Testament. So we we read the Book of Joshua. And this is a story about one ethnic group uh, committing genocide against a, a, some other ethnic groups uh, because God told them to, <laughs> right? That's the read. And so even the problem is addressed from that perspective. And so that sort of doubly problematizes the whole thing because an atheist comes and presents Joshua that way. And rather than the Christian who's responding, questioning that portrayal of what's happening, it's substituting a different cosmology uh, within which these events are taking place, he accepts that reading and then finds himself in the position of trying to defend genocide. Well, no, here's why genocide was okay in this instance, right? Uh, and that then opens up a whole other can of then you get into the whole Euthyphro debate about God. Is it the fact that God commanded it that makes this one okay? Are you saying it's good in general? Uh, are you saying, and, and we shouldn't dismiss the fact that some of those bad answers have had incredible historical consequences, right? So, I mean, one of the most obvious ones with Joshua is manifest destiny in North American settler colonialism was an application, a direct application of that. You read the literature and it's people saying, many of whom identified as Christians, <laughs> saying, hey, just like uh, that land was given to Israel and they were supposed to drive the Canaanites out, the pagan Canaanites out, this land was given to us by God. And that justifies us driving out everyone before us and, and doing what we need to do uh, to take it. And there are countless other examples. That's just a big one. Um, and that obviously, that, that's perpetuating violence and even ascribing God's name to it, even though he hasn't actually said that. Right? Um, so we have to take a few steps back and question those basic presuppositions about the world, right? So... Uh, is what we're talking about, first of all, uh, in Joshua, are we talking about ethnicities, right? The concept of an ethnicity as it exists today, the concept of DNA, right, didn't exist. Uh, and what, what made people part of a certain people group, whether it was Israel or whether it was one of these Hittite groups that are called giant clans uh, in the, the Old Testament, uh, what what made someone part of those groups was determined ritually. So what made you an Israelite was not a certain ethnicity, was not sort of you traced your DNA back to Abraham somehow without science. 
it was that you had been circumcised if you were male or you were married to or the daughter of a circumcised male and you ate the Passover because doing those things put you into a relationship with the Israelite community and with God, with the God of Israel, right? And so now there's this community includes God. You are now a part of it, right? And those relationships between you and God and you and the rest of the community are part of that order of justice. Right? Now, uh, this is part of that cosmology. Um, and likewise with these giant clans, they had rituals of initiation, which were sexual in nature. Uh, and they participated in acts of human sacrifice, uh, we're told in the sources, these giant groups. So that's what made an Amalekite an Amalekite, was that they participated in these rituals that brought them into communion with each other and into communion with the demonic powers who were involved in those rituals, who were at the other end of those rituals. And this is why you find in the Psalms, all the gods of the nations are demons. St. Paul says what the, the uh, Gentile sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. <laughs> this is that view, right? And so what we have here is primarily a spiritual warfare, but that's being fought by humans. Um, that's that's taking place between humans. So the Amalekites, who are one of these giant clans, attempted to exterminate the Israelites um, while they were at the base of Mount Sinai. And this is that passage about them daring to lay a hand upon the throne of, of God while he was there at Sinai uh, with Moses. Um, and so the, the, the war was going both ways. But what that also means is that when we're talking about there need to be no more Amalekites, right? The, the Amalekites need to be wiped out. That doesn't necessarily mean on the material level, every single one of them needs to be murdered, right? What it means is these practices that make one an Amalekite, the rituals, the practices, uh, those have to be stopped. Right? So it was possible for actual humans within those groups to no longer be Amalekites. All they had to do was participate in the initiation rituals and the rituals of another people group. So just as we see examples of the Old Testament, uh, like Caleb and Ruth, of people from these other nations becoming Israelites, right? You, there were people who went, came and left from other people groups. Uh, and... The scriptures themselves say this. This isn't just me coming in with some external stuff. Every time God speaks about those people groups being an exception, it's a specific list of giant clans who are practicing these particular things. He always ties it to the abominations which they practice. And that's why they can't just sort of be left around because if, they're, if, if there are still Amalekites, that means they're still doing these things. And this is why you get the language of is Israelites will end up being seduced by them, right? Israelites will end up coming and becoming Amalekites or Hivites or Gergesites or whichever one you want to pick, uh, whichever ite. <laughs> um, and so that's the, these rituals, these, these things have to be, have to be put a stop to. And in a, in a realistic world, right? While it would have been nice if Israel could have just gone to them and said, this is the Torah. It comes from our God. You should all become Israelites. Uh, they weren't all going to become Israelites voluntarily, especially people who are practicing things like that, right? Because worship works both ways, right? We understand that through our worship of, of God in, in Jesus Christ, we become more like Christ. Right? And we're transformed and our lives are transformed. But the same happens the other way. This is why St. Paul didn't want the Corinthians to be in communion with demons. Right? Because it, it transforms them as well. Right? And so they weren't, most of them were not just going to flip a switch. Right? And so there comes a point where if they refuse to stop practicing these things, what solutions were left in the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age? Right? Um, and that's still shocking to it. Well, you're saying go and kill 
all of these people, right? But I, I've said to people, you know, if if you knew, not you thought, you suspected, you had a conspiracy theory, but you knew for a fact that your neighbor was abducting children and sacrificing them to a pagan god, would you just give them a tract? Right? <laughs> would you would you sit and pray that they would see the light? Or would you call men with guns to to go to their house and stop them from doing that anymore? And if the person refused and resisted those, he would probably end up getting killed, right? But knowing that, I think all of us would still go and say, no, this has to stop, right? This cannot continue. Uh, it would be unjust to let it to let it continue, right? And so if you have whole cultures whole tribal cultures built around these kind of practices in the ancient world, right? Uh, we, we would all think, I think it unjust if we didn't do anything, right? I, I think anyone you asked today would think it would be unjust for the Western nations to just let Hitler do what he wanted. Well, hey, we don't want to do, engage in any violence, right? <laughs> we, should, we should just, you know, Hope he repents, and, and, and right. So, so there is a line that all of us know instinctively is there, uh, and 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 that comes from God and from what justice is. Yeah, I I, I want to slow down here a little bit for some people sure. because I recognize that like those brackets you talked about, the people watching this video are going to have very different sized brackets, and so some of them might have listened to your stuff before or maybe uh you know lord of spirits or, or some similar stuff and be like yeah yeah I, i've got all this this is all like i'm familiar i'm good to go others might have said giant clans yeah. what, what, what are we talking about here yeah. um so I, I recognize that even people who may you know be really into biblical studies and all of these things they they might just not find themselves in these circles where these are conversations that are being had. If they are interested in these, I know I had uh, Dr. Michael Heiser on to talk about demons once. They might enjoy that interview. But I, I want to kind of just slow down right there for some people. Sure. When you say giant clans, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, this is related to uh, the uh, particular to the initiation rituals. Uh, in terms of, of these groups. So we see this first referred to in Scripture in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, uh, where it talks about the sons of God and the, and the daughters of men uh, engaging sexually and, and then giving birth to the, the Nephilim, which is uh, from the same root as an Aramaic word, Nephilim with an N, which we, just means giant. <laughs> um now the word, the word giant, uh, we immediately think of size, right? We think, oh, that's a tall person. As somebody who's six foot four, I don't like being judged, so don't. Um, but uh, uh, that word, actually, both in Hebrew and and in Greek, uh, yiantis, uh, actually, in addition to sort of size, carries with it the idea of a thug or a bully or a tyrant. Right. So the the English equivalent I usually point to is the way we'll use the word strongman to describe a dictator. Right. We say that, person, you know, Panamanian strongman Manuel Noriega. Right. We don't mean he had an incredible bench press, you know, that like he was, this guy was just really ripped. You know, it's it's a term that conveys the idea that this is a dictator. This is a time. He rules through force. He rules through violence. Uh, and so a reference to size or even a depiction of size was a way to convey this, right? Um, and uh, in terms of the initiation rituals, this wasn't uh, some new information in Genesis 6. When you, when you look at the heroes, the kings of the ancient Near East, they were all, they believed themselves and were believed to be part human and part divine. Right, that they were they uh, were the children of mortal humans and the gods whom they worshipped, right? Um, and so uh, this is sort of the earliest and very clear interpretation of Genesis six one through four, 
that you find pretty well universally in Second Temple Judaism, so from 500 BC until the time of Christ. Uh, and then in the church, it's pretty much universal until uh, you get into the fourth century AD. Uh, now that the um, the issue becomes once you get into the fourth century, uh, sort of how do we understand what that means, right? So wait, so you're saying a demon that doesn't have a body somehow impregnated a woman and they had this giant baby, right? <laughs> like, and that sounds weird, right? And it, and it sounded weird in the fourth century. But uh, before the fourth century, right, they, they uh, had kind of a shorthand understanding of what that actually meant. Uh, and that this involved actual rituals, actual sort of sexual rituals we there are in temples. One example being uh, the Babylonian ziggurat at, at Amenanki of ritual beds. Uh, one of these giants, uh, Og, Og, king of Bashan, is probably the most famous one. Uh, it describes, for sort of no apparent reason, it describes the size of his bed in the Torah, and sort of it's like, well, who cares, right? Well, that bed was a description of one of these ritual beds. Right. So the idea was he's one of these, right? He's one of these kings, right? He's one of these people. Um, and you even find this in, in a little more detail in some of the early church fathers still held on to this. So, for example, they'll say that the demons taught sorcery, right? Taught ritual magic to women in order for this to happen. So, and this is a world in which shrine prostitution and temple prostitution was common, where uh, a major portion of the ritual life of these people would involve particularly the king who served as sort of a priest king that wasn't separate in the ancient world outside of Israel. In Israel, it was separated, but other places it wasn't. Uh, they would engage sexually with these temple concubines in these ritual acts that had to do with fertility, that had to do with producing the heir to the throne. Uh, and so uh, these kind of sexual acts were an initiation into these sort of tribe and clan groups that were governed by uh, these kings or leaders or princes or giants or strongmen or whatever we want to call them. Uh, and so this is... Um, this is sort of what's going on behind the scenes uh, of, uh, for example, the episode at uh, Baal Peor or Baal Peor, uh, where the Israelites, these uh, Moabite women, <laughs> show up and like seduce them, <laughs> right? And th that's the sort of the context of it is that it, it's they're being brought in and therefore being pulled out of Israel and into this other unit and those demons were seen to be real that wasn't just sort of a pejorative oh your gods are all demons nanny nanny right it was these were seen to be real evil spiritual powers who are out to corrupt and destroy mankind so baal peor is humans being drawn out of a relationship with israel's god and with his with god's people and into a relationship with these demonic powers and people who are serving those demonic and that was being done through these sort of sexual rituals. Uh, yeah, so that's what, what you get in the fourth century is that there aren't pagans around anymore, around Western Christians. St. John Cashin, his big argument against this understanding of Genesis 6 is, well, why doesn't this still happen? Well, because he didn't see it happening because there weren't any pagans around anymore. But it was still happening in Mesoamerica, and it was still happening in Japan. And it was to, and and a, a version of that ritual goes on in Japan to this day with the Japanese emperor. You could look it up online if you don't believe me. So. <laughs> there, you, there you have it, folks. Yeah, I I think there's ah there's so much I want to get into there. I think that's really helpful for people to kind of slow down there just in case they weren't familiar. And I I hope that this was very interesting for them. I know it, it was for me. That there's two tracks I want to go down. I, I think we've got time to follow one little rabbit trail before I, I press in with a, another question on divine violence about that. But I, 
I think while I have you here, a not only an Orthodox priest, but scholar, uh, biblical theologian, I, I think this is, this is a helpful test case because for many people, I know the uh, one of the allures of orthodoxy is just, I'm going to follow what the church fathers said. We have this great cloud of witnesses. And what I've seen you model here, and I don't want to... Well, I don't want to overstate any of this, but I, I think it's interesting that here's an area where you can say because of certain factors like St. John Cassian not having any pagans around, maybe it hindered his understanding of this text. I, I'm just curious to what level is that kind of an insight into how to interact with the church fathers? Obviously, I know you have a very high regard for the church fathers, yet I also know that when it comes to kind of like knowledge of the ancient Near East, at least from my perspective, it seems like we've learned a good bit recently. How can we take what kind of is like the best of recent scholarly development on ancient Near Eastern thought um, and culture and apply that to how we look at the church fathers who are reading this, who are maybe further removed, say, you know, fifth, sixth century? Yeah. So, yeah, I think this is a question of, of how we read the fathers. Um, and in the Orthodox Church, we don't sort of pick certain fathers and make them infallible or virtually infallible. <laughs> right. um, so there is no single church father ever, right, who is completely infallible and who has nothing incorrect. They're, they're way better off than I am, but, but not, you know, 100%. Um, and so... I think one of the dangers, especially for people who come from a Western background and then come into orthodoxy, is that they, they sort of treat the church fathers the way they used to treat the Bible, especially if they're from a more almost fundamentalist kind of background. Um, I've said sometimes that uh, the general tendency is for uh, orthodox Christians to read the fathers the way evangelicals read the Bible and read the Bible the way evangelicals read the fathers. Uh, meaning <laughs> certain Orthodox people will kind of pick and choose and kind of eh, throw their shoulders up on certain biblical passages. Uh, but then everything a church father says, they proof text, <laughs> right? And sort of take it, take it very literally. Um, and so uh, that's, I don't think is a healthy or good approach to the church fathers. Um, and there's a bunch of presuppositions behind it. There's sort of a pre. I mean, it's a good faith thing. They're, they're trying to say, well, look, I, I've accepted now that I've come into the Orthodox Church that I shouldn't be interpreting the scriptures for myself, right? I shouldn't sort of set myself up as my own authority. Uh, and so I should defer to the authority of those who have gone before me, who are wiser, who lived the Christian life and were more advanced in it than me. That's good, right, <laughs> to, to, to embrace that idea. But um, then the idea is, well, this verse has a meaning and it's out there somewhere. And the way I figure out what it is, is I go and find a church father who talks about it and whatever he says it means, that's what it means. <laughs> right. And that will obviously create huge problems as soon as you find two church fathers who disagree <laughs> or seem to disagree about what a verse means. Right. Because, uh, now you don't know what to do. And so you get sometimes the worst way to handle that, by the way, that it sometimes gets handled in the Orthodox Church is, well, I guess I could pick which one. I guess there's multiple opinions. So I, and now look, I'm the authority again, because I get to pick which church father. Um, so it's more, more important for us to try to discover what the church fathers are doing, right? Not sort of, here's how in this particular sermon, St. John Chrysostom applied this particular text. Right. Even though he did it masterfully, but to say, how is St. John Chrysostom reading and applying the text? Right. How is he doing this? Right. And trying to learn to do that ourselves. We, we call this sometimes. I know you had Dr. Genie on here. Uh, the, the phronema. Right. The, the mind of the fathers, which is also, you know, what St. Paul called that mind, which was also in Christ so that we can look at things and see them. And, and interpret them correctly, right? And so when I see the fathers disagreeing, and this was, this is a good, I think, object lesson in that, as you pointed out, that we have this sort of complete uniformity before a certain date among all the fathers. 
And then over the course of about 150 years, we get almost complete uniformity the other way, <laughs> right? There's this shift, right? And rather than just saying like, okay, well, I guess I get to choose, you know, and I'll point to my, my church fathers and you point to yours, uh, to try and say, okay, well, what changed? What shifted? What accounts for this shift, right? And if we could come up with a plausible explanation for that, that makes sense, right? Well, here's why this church father says X and this one says Y, right? It's not that one of them was just dumb or didn't get it, <laughs> right? But that maybe they're talking to different groups of people. Maybe they're dealing with a very different situation. And the text applies to both situations, but it applies differently, you know? Um, then, then we've gone a, a, a long way to really appropriating what, what the... Uh, what the fathers are doing and and how they're understanding uh, the scriptures. So I, th I think that's very important in terms of how we how we read and understand the fathers. Yeah, and I think it it offers consistency, right? You're applying those same tools that you're advocating to use on the text w with the church fathers. Not saying you're putting them like in the exact same category, but but we're looking at the context and and not only what is being said, but but how is it being said? Like what is the approach to these things? I, I think you're able to kind of use those same tools in that place. And I, I really appreciate what you pointed out about uh, some Orthodox converts, not to paint with too broad of a brush, uh, but that idea of reading the fathers like evangelicals read scripture and reading uh, scripture like evangelicals read the fathers. I, I hadn't heard it said quite like that before, but that that is an interesting point. I, I appreciate you allowing that little detour there. I think that is going to be helpful for people as they try to have a hermeneutic, not only for scripture, but for the, the fathers as well, and hopefully in tandem there. To get back to just maybe one last question on divine violence before we begin to wrap up here, um, and, and we might touch on one kind of fun passage, uh, but I could see some people saying, okay, I see what's going on in these passages a little better now. It, it's not necessarily what we have in mind of like this uh, ethnic cleansing or the, this genocide going on here, but there's actually something much, much deeper, which is within their cosmology. There's kind of a, a spiritual war going on here that is being played out between humans, but it's it's between people ritually defined, right? So you could have a Moabite who it, it says you need to get rid of all the Moabites, but then you can have Ruth the Moabite, but, but she's ritually defined differently. But I could also imagine people who... I, on another level, their kind of Western pluralism kicks in and says, like, wait, like, what are the consequences of this? Could this not be applied to, say, like, the, the Salem witch trials, right? Like, that those were people kind of ritually defined, but I think a lot of people today maybe recoil from that. Or they wonder, how, how much further do we take that, right? Like, okay, maybe people aren't killing people, but I, I think their religious practices ritually defined are harmful, to what extent can they coexist in this modern, diverse world? Do you see where I'm going here? I, I think people might struggle to say, on the one hand, yeah, in extreme cases, child sacrifice, like nobody wants that happening. And this makes sense. But on another level, like how far does that go? Right. And I think that's why it's important to uh, one of the one of the. Uh, the uh, chapters in the book is on holy war. And uh, one of the things that I talk about in there is that there are commandments, and this is very unique in the ancient world, there are commandments in Deuteronomy in particular, uh, dealing with how Israel is to conduct itself in war. And there are very strict rules. And then you get to these giant clans, and there's this exception. I mean, it's literally, except with these groups. <laughs> right? And that's it. And this language uh, is used throughout the Old Testament. The, the analogy that tends to be used is the cup of someone's iniquity being full or not yet being full. Uh, there's never a place, this is one of the differences between the Torah as law and the religious law of some other groups, is that there's never a call for Israel to go and impose the Torah on the world. Right. It never says you need to go and conquer, you know, the Philistines and get them to stop eating pigs. Right? Um, you need to go and circumcise Egypt you know, by force. 
there, there is no call to do that, right? And in fact, not just in Deuteronomy, but in several specific places, God forbids Israel from taking any kind of action against a group. And that group that's being talked about is pagan. So they, they are worshiping other gods. They are worshiping demons, according to the text. There is injustice there. There is evil going on there, right? But, but God is not ready to intervene there, right? With, his, with the Israelite armies or in another way. I mean, sometimes God acts very directly, like Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Um, and, and it's fire from heaven. Sometimes it's the Israelites. Sometimes it's a pagan army. For example, the Assyrians, when God brings judgment against the northern tribes uh, or the Babylonians against against Judah. Uh, so there is a point which is known only to God, a point of his choosing, at which now is the time to intervene. He is the one who judges that. That's why vengeance is his. Where th th there's a balance between uh, providing humanity opportunity to repent to change, to turn back to God, and the cries of the victims, right? The, the blood starting with Abel that cries out to God from the ground for justice. Um, and th there, there's a point where that balances out and where God needs to act on the part of those, those victims to establish justice, or he wouldn't be just, right? We, we wouldn't call him a loving God at that point. Right. The, the people who are going on sinning and sinning and sinning and not facing God's justice would think he was a loving God. But the victims certainly would not right, find him to be a loving God in that in that situation. And when God believes that a civilization or in the case of the flood, the world <laughs> has reached that point, then he intervenes through the means of his choosing uh, to to put us put a stop to it. And we see this play out in the New Testament very much with the return of Christ to judge the living and the dead. Because that's going to be the point at which it's over. Uh, St. Peter says, you know, don't wonder why he's delaying. This is for the sake of mercy, right? So there's as many people as possible could find repentance. But in Revelation, you have the souls of the martyrs beneath the altar crying out, how long, O Lord, until we are avenged, right? So so this, this happens. And you alluded to uh, near the beginning of the interview that we're in a relatively privileged place, most of us who are having this discussion, and the people who are concerned about, as you said, you know, the coexist bumper sticker folks, right? <laughs> and and this embrace of cultural diversity, uh, we're we're not most of the time victims crying out for justice. Sometimes we act like it. It's usually white wines, right? And and you know. Why is the Wi-Fi on my plane not work today? You know, um, but um, you know we we aren't in that we aren't in that position, uh, and so we don't sort of see both both sides of it, right? And this, I think, is one of the reasons why just talk of God's justice and His judgment and His wrath uh, is so off-putting to us as modern Western people. And we want to try and set it aside, right? Because the truth is, I've got an iPhone 13 over here, right? Uh, and, and, and that makes my life easier in various probably unhealthy spiritually and psychologically ways. Uh, but, you know, the, the people who manufactured that were in a factory where they lived that's all but a prison camp. And some of them may have been Christians, and some of them may, in their prayers, be asking God, how long will I have to live like this? Right? And, and they're living that way so that I can have you know, a slightly easier life. And so if we accept that there are probably people out there in the world who are asking God for justice because of ways we've harmed them, ways we don't even know about like that remotely, or people who I've met who I've just been unkind to, or unloving towards, or, or compassionate towards. Um, the fact that I'm even dimly aware of that is why any talk of justice or standing before the judgment seat of God doesn't sound so good. What we find mostly in the Psalms talking about God's justice is positive. It's asking God to arise and judge the earth because it's the cry of people who are in exile. 
who 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 are oppressed. And so I think we need to be aware of that too, right? And and uh, not only should we do what we can to try to set things right, starting with ourselves and our own repentance and our own making things right with those around us, um, to to try to correct those things, but we we need to realize with sympathy, right? You know, the, these people who uh, we're being so open minded, right? And we feel so good about ourselves because we're so accepting of diversity. Uh, some of some of that diversity we're accepting is having horrible effects on them and on the people around them and their culture and their society. And sometimes justice, as much as we don't like it, uh, is exactly not only what they need, but what they're really wanting and really seeking and really crying out for. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it's a sobering thought to think about the the side of that coin, if you will, that we're often on here in the West. I, I had a guest once uh, challenge listeners to wonder whether we're not in our own dark ages of times, given our uh, just our, our greed in the way that it's disproportionately affecting different people. And I, I think especially when you, when you bring up things like that, it it does make us question, why is it that we are, we, we you know, bristle so much at the idea of God's justice when people like, you know, David, when he's being chased by Saul and he's, you know, hiding out and wondering for his life or all these different, you know, laments that that they're crying out for God's justice. That's something they yearn for. I, I think just on kind of, yeah, pastoral level, that's that's something really to, to sit with and, and, and question a bit. So I, I appreciate you you kind of giving us that that depth there for people to kind of walk away with and chew on. I think it would be nice to kind of wrap this up and thank you so much for your time and your work on this book uh, with, with maybe just a, one more way of kind of modeling this reading. You go through a bunch of problem passages and, and we've talked about a couple of them. I think that the conquest uh, passages are, were a helpful way of doing that. Uh, one that I think maybe some people like haven't even read, they might not be familiar with, but you included. And I thought, yeah, this, this is an interesting one. Is uh, it's, it's from 2 Kings uh, chapter 2 with Elisha and the she-bears. So could, could you walk us through that passage a little bit, just kind of demonstrating how you can read a text that feels bizarre and, and maybe come away with a bit better reading? Yeah, yeah. So uh, a surface reading in a lot of English translations and the way it'll get presented to you by uh, someone who's an opponent of Christianity, for example, <laughs> will, will be that, well, Elisha is this prophet. He's out on the road. He runs into a bunch of little kids. The little kids make fun of him for being bald. And uh, God sends bears out of the woods to come and like maul and kill these children for having made fun of, of Elisha. That's sort of the <laughs> quick summary. And that's what they'll throw at you. They'll say, like, yeah, it's some God you got there, right? <laughs> sends, sends, uh, sends bears to, to kill children. So, but that's a, a problematic read of what's actually there in the text on a whole bunch of levels. Um, so first, the first and biggest, and I have to and want to uh, give credit to an old professor of mine, old in terms of I had him a few years ago, not in terms of his age. Um, he is a little older than me, but <laughs> uh, and that's uh, Dr. Rodney Cloud has done a huge amount of work on the particular Hebrew word na'ar that's used to describe these quote unquote children, the word that's translated as, as children. Uh, and uh, that word is actually incredibly diverse. A lot of English Bible translations always translate it as child or children, uh, except for places where it's just painfully obvious that that's not what it means. But if you look at the Greek translations of the Old Testament, it's actually translated with 16 different Greek words in different contexts. So that gives you an idea of the range of meaning here. So Na'ar refers to a younger person, right? But in many cases, in probably the majority of cases where it's used in the, um, in the Old Testament, it's actually referring to uh, young men and, and particularly like young adult men, and particularly young adult men who are in some kind of what we would call civil service. There's some kind of court official 
king's official, right? So this word is used regarding, you know, Daniel and the youths, right, in, in the book of Daniel. Um, but this is also used of, like, some of Saul and David's warriors. So they weren't sending, like, children into battle with <laughs> armor and swords, right? These were sort of the young, the young up-and-coming officials. So right off the bat, as Elijah is walking, uh, or Elisha is walking on the road, he's, he encounters a group of, of 50 uh, of these young adult, right, uh, officials. Um, and one would imagine, right, you're not going to find, like, between 50 and 75 small children wandering the road between towns. Like, that, that would be a little weird even today if I was on my way from Lafayette to Baton Rouge and I saw a mob of 75 children. Like going down the side of the highway, um, so uh, these are these are court officials, on a, uh, young court officials on a journey on foot, right? And then if you look at particularly what they say uh, to Elisha, they they don't aren't just making fun of him for having male pattern baldness. Uh, they say, "Go on up, you baldhead." So the word that's translated "baldhead" is actually a word that that refers to a lot of skin diseases and conditions. So they're not just saying, oh, you're losing your hair. They're calling him diseased. They're calling him sort of corrupt and, and diseased. And they're telling him that go on up is go up as into the high place that was there along the road. So we're talking about nor the Northern Kingdom of Israel, their religion that was started by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the first king of the northern kingdom, he set up the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. He had developed a sort of paganized version of the worship of the God of Israel. Uh, and then since then, it had gotten worse, right? People are familiar with Ahab and Jezebel, with Elijah, Elisha's predecessor. Uh, she had brought in Phoenician religions, so Baal, uh, not a whole series of, of other gods. This was one of the pagan high places. So these are young court officials. These are like, you know, brown shirts in Nazi Germany. These are like the, the, the street thug end of the king who's opposed to God and his prophets, right? And this is, remember, Jezebel killed hundreds of the prophets of God. Uh, so this is, this is not just sort of he's walking by and they're making fun of him. This is threatening, right? This is, and there's a whole lot more of them than there are of him. And they're trying to compel him to go and offer sacrifices at this, at this pagan shrine. And so in the midst of that confrontation, where Elisha's life is being threatened, he's trying to be forced, that's when the bears come out to defend him, to protect him and rescue him from this assault. Right. So this is, this is not a story of God punishing kids for making fun of a grown-up. Uh, this is a story of God protecting his prophet uh, from this sort of official opposition, these people in power who were trying to, to attack uh, his prophet. And so sort of nature itself rose up to, to defend him. So that's, that's a very different story. And it's conveying a very different lesson about the protection of God, even if you're living in, you know. And, and we talked about how, you know, different points in our lives and different situations, these can become important. If you're a Christian, as many Christians, particularly in the 20th century, living in a totalitarian kind of state, right? Living, living in a place where there is, uh, uh, even today in many countries of the world, there's a, official opposition where your, your life is on the line. This story of God using even the elements of nature to protect someone who is faithful to him this could be a very powerful story if read in that original context with understanding. Yeah, it really can. And I think it's a great example of not necessarily taking an antagonistic reading or just a seeming surface reading at, well, surface level, but really digging in, like, what is the text actually getting at here? Because, again, none of us want to be in the position of defending God for killing children for pointing out that someone has male pattern baldness. Like, that's a really odd moral position to try to defend, but often that's what people in good faith attempt to do, when in fact they, they don't actually have that heavy of a moral burden to carry there if they can just dig into that text a little deeper. Now, granted, that's going to take some work to, to learn some of these things and 
Well, luckily for us, today there are more resources available than ever of people who have put in like a life's work on a single Hebrew word. But we can glean from those things and glean from other people uh, to, to help with those things. And we can start by reading your book. Uh, so, th so thank you so much uh, for this. This really has been a pleasure. I think you were one of the last guests I had on previously before I started doing this thing called the final four, which are four rapid fire questions. But before we jump into that, I just want to make sure, is there anything you'd like to leave uh, listeners, viewers with uh, about either the book that you haven't been able to say, or just uh, about this topic in general? Yeah. Well, just, just a super brief tidbit dove, dovetailing off of what you just said. The, the way the book is structured is I go through sort of principles first for the first several chapters, and then the final chapter is sort of dealing with those problem passages. So what I'm hoping someone will come away with is what I'm, I'm trying to model, okay, here are biblical principles, and then here's how we can apply those in these passages. So I'm hoping, I don't want people to read it, as I was just talking about with the church fathers, and say, oh, well, de young is right on this so i'm just going to go with whatever de young says you know on this on this that or the other but i'm i'm hoping to say here's a way of approaching the text so that people will go and approach the text using that same kind of method even if they come to different conclusions than me cuz i may on some of my specific conclusions i probably am not correct so yeah i i appreciate that humility and the structure of the book is really really helpful in that. So, so thanks for all the work and intentionality you put into this. Of course, there'll be a link to the book down in the description if people would like to go check that out. But without further ado, uh, I will jump into the final four, which is just a nice way for people to get to know the guests. And like I said, I think, I think you missed this last time. So here we go. Uh, what has been the most fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? Yeah, um, I think, and this is going to be weird and, and, maybe just specific to me. Um, but um, I have tried to be very deliberate about, be, I started it because I wanted to keep my language knowledge up. Uh, so uh, reading certain texts, it's it's actually the book of Joshua in, in Hebrew and uh, uh, going through first John, which I did my dissertation on in, in, in Greek, but going through certain texts in the original language sort of over and over again, <laughs> um, or initially to keep the language up. But doing that with those texts, I now wanna find some other texts to do that with for a few years because reading and rereading and re 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 reading, uh, it's amazing how things sort of unfold. Uh, and and uh, so to me, that's been the most spiritually fruitful thing I've done. And I think if someone else wanted to try something similar, you could probably do it in English with a good translation or maybe alternate translations. Read the same text through and then read it in another translation and then another translation it might be a way to do that in English. Yeah, that's a really neat one. And it's an answer I haven't gotten. I always love the diversity of answers I get to that question. Uh, the second question is outside the Bible, what has been the most impactful book on your life? Yeah, this is this is going to be a, a, an answer you're not going to get from I don't think anybody else on this one, and that's uh, what is what I would still call my favorite novel to this day, and that's Albert Camus' The Stranger, uh, which uh, I first read when I was uh, when I was 16, and very and and I was very 16. I was in full rebellious teenager mode, and uh, Albert Camus really has a way of showing how kind of pure rebellion is fruitless and self-destructive and nihilistic. Um, and it sort of helped me uh, come back from that kind of teenage dirtbag status uh, back to toward becoming a more productive human being. again. So that's wonderful. I have not gotten that one. I've gotten fiction before, but but not uh, that. So I'll add it to the list. All right. You're having coffee with your undergrad, early grad school self. What's one piece of advice you'd give him for his future in theology? Yeah, the uh, I, I my turnaround was not that quick, so I probably wouldn't listen to myself. Um, but uh and this may be kind of obvious in my case, but it would be, hey, you should go check out the Orthodox Church. 
because <laughs> um, I really had no clue about it at, at the time. Uh, but as I look back at my life on the way there, there were a lot of signs hmm. that that's where, I mean, I only see them now after the fact, but that that's where God was leading me. Uh, I probably wouldn't have listened to myself, but, uh, and, and to be fair, I may not have been ready. And that may very be, well be why God didn't bring me there at that time. I may not have been ready to appreciate what was going on in the Orthodox Church, but uh, still, that's probably what I would tell us. Fair enough. All right, last question. And I might be biased, but this might be my favorite question I get to ask all my guests. Uh, this channel is named Gospel Simplicity, but it's often pointed out that things get a little complex. Sometimes we even use big words like gigantomachy, uh, <laughs> which makes people wonder, should this be called gospel complexity? Like, what are you getting at here, Austin? Um, but in your own words, in a sentence or so, what is the gospel? Yeah, it's that... Uh... Jesus Christ, who is the God who created the universe, uh, has uh, defeated the powers of sin and death and is returning to judge the living and the dead. There you go. And then hopefully that would elicit the question, what must I do to be saved if I've done it correctly? <laughs> there you go. Well, Father Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. This has been such a pleasure to have you back on the channel. And I'll close as I always do by telling everyone until next time, be on the lookout for more videos, but far more importantly than that, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world. Mm -hmm.